Okay, we are live with uh, Riva Tez, Judge Brock. Judge, you are at the Cicero Institute. Um, Riva, you are at Intel and are a, a Lincoln Network Policy Act Fellow. Thank you so much for coming. How are you guys doing? Great, thanks. Great, thank you. We were discussing this off stage with Riva. You win the Reboot Award for Most Diverse Background. Uh, it's not, you can't turn it into anything, but you know, that's something. <laughs> I just uh, never do videos on my call so that people don't know how unprofessional my backgrounds are, but for you guys, I'll make an exception, so. Of, of course, so we are talking about California, um, and apparently I'm a horrible booker because Riva, you no longer live in California, and Judge, um, in two months or so, you're moving to Austin. So maybe that says something about California, we could get into that, but you know, this isn't technically a Californians about California topic since I'm out in DC, but um, thanks for coming either way. Yeah. Of course, well, thanks. I'm not even American, so some element of a British accent in Vegas talking on this topic, I think has extra hubris, but uh, I'm arrogant enough to handle it. So it's, I'll, I'll go for it anyway. So here's the best place to start. Before COVID, because insert, COVID changes everything, trends accelerate. We've all heard the sort of framework there. Before COVID, how would you sum up your thoughts on California? Especially because I believe you both were living there and at least were staying there. So let's start with you, Judge. How were you sort of thinking about California basically in February? Uh, well, in many ways, California is an incredibly successful state. It's still the largest state in the union, about 40 million people. Uh, it still, by many measures, has the highest average per capita income, at least close with uh, other states like Connecticut and uh, uh, New Jersey. Uh, but on the other hand, it also has uh, cost of living adjusted, the highest poverty rate in the nation. It also has a net outflow of migrants to other states consistently for the past uh, 10, 20 years. It also has a tax system that's very variable and during recessions like the one we're facing right now tends to be incredibly erratic and very dangerous for the state. Uh, so it's a state with an immense amount of talent, immense amount of resources, uh, immense amount of companies and money, uh, but a lot of problems that are becoming very manifest right now during the COVID crisis. How about you, Riva? Uh, yeah, I, I, when I was prepping for this call, actually, one of the things I noticed when I was looking at the exodus numbers of uh, California and the Bay Area was that uh, actually in 2018, no, 2019, 74% of millennials had plans to leave the Bay Area within five years. Um, so I wonder if it's, you know, as much as we blame COVID for this, you know, mass exodus, the sentiment was already there, um, much to Judge's point that there are these, you know, issues around inequality and 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 house pricing and, and homelessness and dangerous threats on, on, on the streets and stuff. So uh, COVID may have been an accelerator to that, but there was definitely a sentiment before it any, anyway, and, and and most of the people that I know who've left California, I mean, I left actually, I was leaving before COVID even happened. I mean, people think I timed it correctly and must be some sort of spy, but I, uh, it was it was, uh, it was very much a sentiment that uh, it seems to be accelerated by the pandemic, if anything. So Judge um, Antariva, Judge, your um, you know colleague, Joe Lonsdale, decided to start off today's reboot with the statement that People who are fat and happy will stay in sort of Palo Alto, the Bay Area. Those who are interested in building will leave to places like Austin that you're sort of talking about. So um, without asking you to contradict him too much, could you all just sort of speak to the idea of the sort of generational change that you could hypothetically be seeing here um, when it comes to where people are going to want to go from a building the future perspective? Uh, yeah, so it uh, he's right. The people here will largely stay. Uh, there is an exodus. People have been leaving gradually. As I mentioned, about half a million uh, people uh, leave the state for other states every year. Uh, those are largely working class families, uh, people who can't afford a house, people who can't do other things. Uh, the main difference, I mean, and that's hurting the state, but there's also a net international inflow of migrants into the state, which is balancing the population more or less. Yeah, the real difference is you're just not going to attract the same sort of talented people that California used to attract in the past. Uh, with by far and away the highest cost of living in the nation and the highest cost of housing and renting in the nation, people aren't very interested in paying $4,000 a month for a one-bedroom home in San Francisco uh, when they can get uh, a decent-sized house outside of Houston or, uh, or Dallas for that. 
Uh, so on the margin, California will probably keep losing uh, a lot of its working class families to other states. Uh, yeah, the people who are successful here are going to stay, but uh, it's not going to keep attracting the new exciting entrepreneurial people it did in the past. And as long as the cost of living is high, as long as the quality of life is not good, uh, that's not going to change anytime soon. Yeah. How about you, Reva? Yeah, and, and to Judge's point, it seems to be an age thing as well. Around you know the the stat that I referred to earlier about the seventy four percent, it was millennials who were thinking about leaving, right? Because if you want to start a family or you know save the money from your great paying tech job, and you're giving so much in taxes plus to rent, um, you know plus. You don't have a yard and 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 an earthquake risk and smokes from fires. It's not exactly the kind of place where you think I'm going to stick roots for for the next ten years and 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 start a family here, which is one of the things I was thinking too. And um, it's it's going to and one of the things I also see on especially on Twitter uh, or on social media is this kind of divide around people who say no, we're long California, we're long San Francisco. And and I know privately a lot of them are just homeowners, right? So it's like a difference between <laughs> homeowners and and renters. Like the renters, like oh, I got out many of us have gone out and Austin and Miami seem to be uh, big uh, hubs for this. Um, not many in Vegas. I think I know like two, and which is one of the reasons why I also picked it. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, you're going to have this generational issue where maybe it'll become, you know, like a retiree town, right? Like it'll just become a place where the former tech success people lived and, and the young, the young people who want to establish their lives will maybe come and make some money, but, and then leave, which is, you know, the kind of exodus that we've been seeing. So Judge, you're obviously, despite uh, moving, you're still deeply engaged with policy. So as we're thinking up these issues, and Riva, thank you for sort of bringing up the fact that most of what we're talking about doesn't really have that much to do with COVID, right? Obviously rent was terrible before COVID, those cost of living issues were terrible before COVID. So Judge, let's just sort of focus on policy then, right? So as you're thinking about California, like what would you sort of say are your sort of top line priorities for someone who's remaining or for someone who's going to these new sort of cities because the sort of joke is everyone's moving to Austin and they're bringing their California problems with them. So it's not as if you're actually solving anything. So what's your top line? Uh, so what Reva mentioned is correct. Uh, far and away, the biggest issue in California is uh, the cost of housing. Uh, house in most of America, usually a decent sized suburban house, say over 2,000 square feet, is going to cost you, set you back, say around $200,000. In San Francisco, San Jose, it's going to cost you well over a million dollars. So we're talking about uh, four to five times higher than the rest of the country. That is absolutely obscene. And there's no reason why a lot of people will move to a place uh, that's going to cost five times uh, what they're paying elsewhere. Uh, maybe for, as we've also pointed out, a quality of life, not that much better. Uh, everything from uh, the human waste on the streets to the smoke blanket in the skies uh, doesn't offer a lot of reasons for people to, to move in a very high cost area. Uh, so uh, my biggest focus by far is trying to bring that cost of housing down. And the way to do that is, is what you think, a lot less regulation on housing building uh, but one of my main focus, too, is actually to try to change the political incentives so local governments try to approve housing again. Right now, the state has really messed up the sort of fiscal and political incentives for local governments to allow more people to move there and allow more houses to be built. And we can talk about that more later. But uh, reducing that cost of housing is probably the number one issue to try to get people back into California. I, I guess the last thing I do before, to say, before turning it over here is there are two ways to do that. One, reduce the cost of housing by dropping the demand, by making it so unlivable that people want to move away, uh, or just driving people away with the bad taxes and the rest or the uh, the advantages of other places during COVID. Uh, ideally, we can reduce the cost of housing by driving flooding affordable for everybody. That will remain the biggest single goal for, uh, for changing California policy. Yeah, and Reva, less from sort of a... If you have direct policy thoughts, like that's great too. But sort of if you, as you sort of think about the issues that you like are sort of you were seeing in San Francisco, what would your priorities be when it comes to addressing them? Or well, what's your important? Yeah, I do love the idea that maybe California governance is like heavy accelerationism to a better to a better world, because uh, then it would make a bit more sense in the policy decisions they've been making. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things about California policy that just annoyed me uh, that uh, uh, that caused me to leave. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the the smoke. I mean, we talk about 
you know, environmentalism in, in, in California, and there's a very strong progressive push around the environment. And I mean, Jerry Brown himself vetoed bills that would have taken actions against uh, uh, overhead utility th uh, wire threats back in 2016. And, you know, Gavin Newsom is making some sort of earthquake tracking app and banning straws or whatever he's doing. So it's like we don't have this actionability. And, and there's a point where, you know, you don't feel safe. Right. Uh, there was an element where when I was talking to my friends during the pandemic, we were in lockdown and you know, we were in lockdown, too, in Vegas. But they also had smoke and, you know, they don't have a yard and, and all of these issues. But, you know, the, the, the policy incentives seem very off. It doesn't seem to be about accountability to actually solve the problem. It's about signaling that you're doing something like everyone. Everyone can go to a restaurant and see that they've banned straws or go to a supermarket and see that we've banned plastic bags and believe that they're doing something. And they don't know about the corruption going behind the scenes that goes from the utility companies to Jerry Brown's campaign field, so cam cam campaign funds. So there's an element where it, it feels in California that the the perspective around policy, and it's not just in California, it's probably everywhere in the world, which is that it doesn't pass the marshmallow test, right? It's like, we'll always take the thing that's the easiest first thing to like eat the initial marshmallow, but we won't wait or do the hard thing to get the later price down the line. And we end up with all of these issues um, kind of compounding over time and no one taking this, the kind of, we don't have any politicians that I can think of in California that want to take the time to sit and say, you know, this has got to stop. We've got to have accountability for homelessness and not just blame the climate for climate change, but also our bad policy decisions and go from there. And without accountability and incentives, um, California will be doomed. Uh, and as will any other place that doesn't have incentives and accountability. Yeah, that's actually good to build on a point you were making, Judge, about focusing on the local political incentives that are driving the system. I mean, I'm, I'm from Oregon, so it's sort of a smaller scale version of a lot of the dynamics in California, especially relating to sort of an issue of an uncompetitive political system, which sort of drives these issues. If you add an uncompetitive political system to sort of the hyper-nationalization of politics, you don't really have a situation where there's an incentive to take action. So how do you think broadly about just that topic of governance to Reva's points? Yeah, so I, I think just like you mentioned, sort of the hyper nationalization of politics is a big problem in terms of it. It shifts people's attentions from a lot of local issues, like the famous line uh, from uh, uh, from Tip O'Neill, the old uh, Massachusetts congressman, that all politics is local. Most political scientists say that's no longer true, uh, and there's a lot of downsides to this. Recent political scientist Alan Abramovitz says all politics today is national. A lot of people very much like. Uh, Governor Newsom in California because he's very anti-Trump and they really don't care as much about whether or not he's keeping the streets clean or whether or not he's keeping uh, the fires down or keeping the smoke away or the rest of it. That nationalization of politics is giving a lot less air for local politicians and state politicians to solve these problems. Um, but so besides that political incentive, which is destructive in and of itself, there's also just the centralization of politics in Sacramento in the state government as opposed to all of the local governments. And now a lot of my YIMBY friends, these groups, yes, in my backyard, they're trying to encourage more housing construction, would disagree with me on this. But I think one of the main problems in California is actually so much of what now happens in California goes through Sacramento and then goes back down to the local level. Uh, so basically all education funding goes up to the state and then it spins back down to the state level. Uh, to the local level. In most of the country, it's not like that. You raise money in your backyard for a new housing development or a new business or a new factory, your local government gets to keep a lot of that money. And so you have an incentive to say, yeah, sure, let's bring the business here. Let's bring the new uh, neighbor here. Let's bring the new housing here. And right now they say, why would I vote to allow a new housing development or a new business or new whatever? All that money is going 200 miles away to Sacramento and could go to some other community. Uh, so just like I think there's a lot of benefits nationally to try to move politics down to the federal level or to the state level, the same thing happens on the state. we got to move a lot more of that policy down to the local level to allow these local governments to compete with each other in terms of quality of life, in terms of the fiscal uh, gains they can get from development and all the rest of it. And right now, that centralization trend is just keeping on in California, and that's preventing that sort of efflorescence of different policy ideas we need to get the state back on track. Yeah, so we obviously can't talk about any of this without bringing in the fact that um, Joe Biden was declared the winner this weekend. Um, how much to sort of both of y'all's points about sort of the nationalization of politics, how much do you think sort of a Biden era would like positively or negatively affect these sort of dynamics, especially to the point about sort of the question for, with Gavin Newsom isn't like, how are you performing with, you know, 
like crap on the streets. It's like, how are you doing at checking and dunking on President Trump? How much is this going to change? I'll start with you, Reba. Oof. <laughs> well, I one of my concerns. I actually was I was both surprised um, and uh, well. When I saw how many Californians voted for Trump, it was interesting for me, I mean, a little bit more than in 2016, um, that there was kind of like two ways that uh, you could think about California than the rest of the country, which is a lot of people look at California and say, like, this isn't a model of how we want the rest of the country to go. And a lot of people look at California and say, this is a model we maybe want the rest of the country to. And there's, and there's probably a third more powerful kind of mix, which is maybe this isn't the way that we want the rest of the country to go, but we really hate Trump, right? So, so there's some, some element of that. Um, but what happens if you turn America, which seems to be some of the Democratic Party kind of progressive angle, um, if you turn America into into California, that Californianization of America happens. And I think there's this kind of Hollywood L.A. dream that the future conversations are going to be about I don't know, Lady Gaga's glitter supply or something. But I, I don't think that's what the conversation will be. I think just as how we had an exodus from California, we'll end up having conversations about whether or not an exit tax from, from the US to renounce citizenship is fair at 23.8%. I can imagine these are gonna be conversations that if we allow the really progressive parts of California to come through to the rest of America and, and the role of the Democratic Party, I think for the sake of America is to, is to think about what has worked and what hasn't worked. And California is a breeding ground for like a testing ground to see kind of what has worked and what hasn't worked with some of these progressive policies. Yeah, what do you think, Judge? Uh, yeah, no, I, I largely agree with that. Now, so the main thing California wanted from a Biden presidency was a bailout. Uh, the budget is short by about a fourth this year. They're short $50 billion, uh, and they really needed the federal government to give them a lot of cash to tie them over until the, the economy revived. It looks like with a split uh, Senate or a split Congress, that may not happen. So California's greatest wish may not come true and they'll have to solve their fiscal uh, problems themselves. Uh, but the the main thing I, I think that people should learn from this election, and I know we're gonna get into the propositions too later, is that California voters are not uh, ultra uh, progressive necessarily. Just like if you think uh, Florida voters that voted overwhelmingly for Trump are not all that conservative. Florida voted for a minimum wage increase, Illinois, Deep Blue Illinois voted against a progressive income tax. Uh, and if you look at the referendums and ballot propositions in California, the libertarian position more or less swept them. They they were against uh, a unionized extra officials for kidney dialysis centers. They were against the, the restrictions on gig economy. They were against another tax increase on businesses, local uh, commercial property. Uh, the California voters are not the sort of ultra liberal uh, bugbears of a lot of the conservative imagination. They're kind of the the center moderate left that uh, you think they'd be, and not that different from voters in much of the country. Uh, so I think in the in the future, like the the Biden presidency, I think just like people will hopefully have less focus on just what your position vis-a-vis -vis Trump is, and more focus on the local sort of issues. Uh, it will force the sort of uh, the people in California and the elected officials to say, well. A lot of the policies we're getting that Visa Reba mentioned about straws or plastic bags and the rest of it aren't that important. Uh, what voters care about is what they care about the most of the, the country. Taxes, cost of living, health care, you know, the polls are very consistent about that. And for those things, they're, you know, the, the voters, even in California, are pretty moderate. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 sorry. Sorry. I think it'll be interesting to see if the Democratic Party can kind of learn how much they will learn from that, that, that those progressive narratives didn't work very well. And I took it as a very positive sign to see the, the, what the votes were on, um, on, on well, over the last week, because like I said, you, I, there's a living in California, you worry, okay, wait, do the, does everybody around me think these policy changes, these ideas are good, right? You're like, does everybody around me think that banning straws is a good idea? It doesn't seem so from Twitter, but we're voting these people in. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that, goes over time. But uh, yeah, it, made me, it did make me very optimistic that, that it was much, much more moderate in California than anybody projected. Yeah. So before we get into um, AB 22, we should be fair um, and say, what is California doing right? Because Reaver, I like your point about, in many ways, you could sort of articulate the idea that California is like the future of American politics. But 
what do you all see with California? Because obviously a lot of people want to move to California. There is LA, like there is San Francisco. These are iconic cities. Like what, what do you see as sort of the good parts of this state that any sort of bright future would sort of come from? We'll start with you, Judge. Uh, well, I, I think the most important thing uh, is, is still its people. California has an incredibly well-educated, incredibly diverse, uh, incredibly productive citizenship. It remains, as again, as I said, uh, one of the highest income earning per capita, despite a, a very high poverty rate. Uh, and as long as California has that, it bodes well for the future. I mentioned the, how high, the high housing prices. And as bad as that is, it is a better sign than having extremely low housing prices. We could obviously have housing prices like in Detroit, which you can get a nice house in Detroit for $7,000. That's not a sign of success. The fact that housing prices are so high here is a, is a sign that supply is being kept too low, but it's also a, a sign that there's a lot of other productive people that want to work here. Uh, Policy-wise, there's not too, too much to recommend the California mode of governance right now, uh, but they know that there are actually a lot of, because Reba was saying too, uh, the voters still remain pretty moderate. And the, uh, the economy itself remains pretty successful. And as long as they can keep a, a significant amount of that, those successful individuals here, California can still thrive. Yeah, totally. I mean, in my case, I just want to say, even though I you know, wrote articles about leaving California, I love California. There was a reason why I gave up my home and my life back. I was living in Germany at the time. I visited California and the people, it was, I mean, San Francisco, especially 2014, 2015, or, you know, even earlier, I can't remember when I first came out, seven years ago. Um, it was the Acropolis of our generation. You know, you go into any room and I felt great that I was probably the dumbest person in the room. It was such a melting pot of, of minds and beautiful nature. Like you can do anything in California. It's one of the most beautiful, you know, areas in the world. I love California. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, there's, there's a part of me that felt very sad to leave. It was almost like I was giving up on something that I had really cared about. But there's some level where your care and your like daily life becomes, you know, you have to make a trade off. And, you know, when I came back, I came back after I went to Turkey for six weeks at Christmas to see my parents. When I came back, there was, you know, uh, uh, bin trash can fires outside my building and I, my rent got put up to five grand. And I was like, what am I doing? And I moved to Palo Alto and I was bored out my mind. So then that didn't work either. So, you know, there's some element where I hope we can save California. We, we should, I hope that the tech community and I, you know, there's some friends of mine that I'm really pushing to like run for positions. We should get more involved. Uh, and if, if we can get more people involved, then, you know, maybe we can do something really cool there. I, I don't think it's something that we should give up on. I think we just need to get high integrity people who care about accountability and incentives much, much more involved and back them heavily and, and find ways to save what is a, well, save, but, you know, you know, restore some level of living, you know, quality to what is a beautiful place. Uh, so that would make me optimistic. And I, if anybody wants, I'm desperate to do that. So. Yeah. So on the topic of sort of the tech community and politics, starting if you judge, what lessons can sort of tech or sort of like more sort of pro market oriented folks take from AB 22 and the way that sort of went? Okay. Yeah. And just for some background for those, don't, those who don't know, uh, recently there was a state Supreme Court ruling and then later a state legislative law that passed that basically banned gig work. Most importantly, people like Uber or Lyft who were driving part-time, they would have to become full-time employees with uh, health care and regulations in terms of hours and wages and all the rest of it. And Uber and Lyft and others said this might be the end of their business. Uh, and they might have left the state if that had stood. Uh, also to that extent, it actually made it very difficult for basic freelancers who were doing things like, uh, who, were, who were doing things like uh, doing filming part-time or whatever to go about their business. A uh, proposition was made to overturn that Supreme Court ruling and that legislative law, and it passed pretty, pretty resoundingly. Uh, and so that shows that most people didn't want these sort of restrictions. The tech industry did pay a lot of money for this, uh, but unions and others also paid a lot of money on the other side. Uh, the, the simplest victory came down to the fact that people didn't want to uh, have the government restricting their ability to conduct their daily lives and their business. And again, like we saw in a lot of the other California ballot propositions, that held pretty true across the board. Yeah, how about you, Reva? Yeah, I, well, you know, I, I only got to experience 
Prop 22, when I was in California, I would call an Uber and it would like give me the push notification saying, oh, our drivers think that this is good, like whatever. Um, and the thing that worried me, I mean, I haven't been uh, so involved with California ballots is that um, there was some element where I did worry a bit about how what will shape policy is less about you know dem democracy and, and, and knowledge, but if you get a, if you're using a service and you get a push notification again, it's a marshmallow test, right? If it says we're going to disrupt your service tomorrow, um, then you're going to do whatever it can you can to like follow that thing. And there's some element where that freaked me out a bit. Less, I don't know anything about employment law. My hunch is that Prop 22 is is the right thing, um, but I again, I I I haven't looked into it enough at all. But there's some element where. When we go into these debates, especially about technology, I do worry about what happens when you have the people who are making decisions as users on these platforms and you disrupt their service or you influence influence them in some way. Like when the discussions come out about Section 230 and if Google and Facebook and Twitter are pushing push notifications about it, like that's going to affect people. And then it means, you know, who has the power here? Does te technology have the power? Does democracy have the power? Is there, you know, what's the fine line there about what should happen? And, and I honestly, like when I saw these, Uber notification saying, you know, our drivers don't want this to pass and we want to be exempt from AB5. I did think like, how do I know if this is right or not? I have no idea. It could be like the election 2020 polls. Like who knows what I'm being told? I was like, well, if the drivers want it, then that's the right thing. But um, it, the thing that concerned me more was that, uh, is that uh, how, is, how is public opinion being shaped by the people who are so, you know, getting, gaining from these things? I mean, $205 million spent by these tech companies for, for Prop 22 is the most well-funded ballot in U.S. history, let alone California. So, um, yeah, my, my my concern is much much more on the on the influence side. Maybe in this case it was for the right thing, but maybe in the next time it might not be for the right thing. That's really interesting. Um, and Judge, I want to bring this to you. Then, how do you think you should balance to Reba's framing of it, sort of like tech and democracy, basically the power that tech companies have when they wield it? effectively right because you know parker thompson and i were speaking right before this his point was the tech community is incredibly naive about politics and that's sort of a fundamental gap if you've had just sort of revolve over 30 40 years so how do you think you balance and i, and I think the, to the point of this conversation you're going to see ab 22 encourage much more aggressive work from the tech industry how do you how do you balance those dynamics and so the, the tech industry has, has learned to, to get up to speed on politics pretty quickly. I forget the exact year, but as recently, I want to say, as six or seven years ago, Facebook had one or two lobbyists in Washington. Uh, now I, I, I think it, uh, I want to say at least in the hundreds. Uh, uh, so they have had to learn very quickly that politics matter. Um, the, the old line that Trotsky said about war applies, even if you don't care about politics, politics cares about you, and they've been forced to sort of engage on this. So uh, on Uber and Lyft and a lot of the other uh, groups, Airbnb, one of the important things the tech in those groups, the tech industry, as opposed to Facebook and the rest of them, had to learn pretty early, is they were always bumping against regulatory barriers. That Their whole model existed on the fact that the existing regulation was favoring incumbents, and they had to find a way to get around that. And what they found is, yeah, they spent a lot of money often overcoming those local or state level initiatives. Uh, they did this in uh, in New York City in, I want to say, 2015, overcoming Mayor Bill de Blasio's attempt to regulate it. And they spent a lot of money. But the thing they found uh, is that actually the main thing that worked is, yeah, engaging their customers who really cared about the service. And the same thing with Airbnb when they tried to restrict short term rentals in New York. And they found they had a very strong customer base. And as uh, the senator, the former representative Barney Frank said, uh, votes always beat out money. Uh, the money does help, but we saw things like the progressive income tax uh, ballot proposition in Illinois overwhelmingly spent uh, on the, the money spent on the pro-income tax side failed overwhelmingly. The, uh, the same thing happens in a lot of these tech things. People actually, their main power comes from the fact that they have a big group of uh, customers who are willing to write uh, their representatives in a way they never were willing to perform. You even saw this recently on things like FanDuel, the, the sports betting website, was able to mobilize their customers to write to uh, to the local representatives and state and federal representatives, don't ban state uh, online gambling for football games. Like, it's amazing. These people usually never would write to their person about anything. And uh, they really cared about that. So as long as tech has those very dedicated customers and fan base, I think that's going to be the main thing stopping uh, the regulators and the state governments from uh, stopping them in their tracks. And they know to, to mobilize them, which is a good thing. 
Yeah, so as we're nearing the end here, it seems to me the debate over states like California's future is a good, it lines up well for the debate about the future of cities sort of post COVID. There are a lot of people who aren't very, um, who are quite bearish on some places like New York and sort of San Francisco and sort of a remote first world. What are your just broad thoughts of start to be on sort of like the future of cities? Like, is that something you're sort of excited about? Like, are we going to see you in Jackson Hole next time? Like, how is this sort of working? Listen, I would already be in Jackson Hole if I could drive. Um, so, <laughs> well, there's maybe a, there's a structural barrier to where you're going to be able to go. There is, there is a structural barrier. Um, well, you know, I think it's good that perhaps cities are getting a little bit less attention, right? I mean, America is a beautiful place. It's also very, very big. When you condense the same type of people in the same places all, all the time, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of my a lot of my friends who work in tech have kind of seen, you know, they've spent, they've built their careers in, in, in technology and in cities. And now that they have the freedom, especially in this kind of half, permanently half remote decade, perhaps, or whatever it's going to be, as we go into like kind of remote world things, like, well, people do want land, they do want garden, they do want nature, and they don't have to drive for it and traffic and, and, and do all these things. So I wonder if there's an element where those LAs and San Francisco's and New York's and stuff will never quite be exactly the same that it was before, but they might end up being better. Um, and that's because, you know, you don't have the art and the music and the jazz and all this stuff that you get when you have a city that is uh, has a little bit less of the concentration of wealth um, and that it's keeping all the prices high. I mean, I came from uh, to California from Berlin, right? Like Berlin, that the city motto was poor but sexy, which I thought was such an unambitious slogan for a city. Like imagine your city mayor is like, we're poor but sexy. And it's, everyone's like, okay. Um, and it was kind of amazing. It's like, you sit around, you go to like, everything was like a music festival. It had culture. Um, so there's, I think maybe it works out the best for everybody. You get a little bit more culture and a little bit more diversity in these cities. And, and people remember how amazing the country is and, and, and go spread out and, um, and take diversity of thought with them. So maybe the end goal of COVID and this you know, city change is potentially a beneficial one on both sides. It's an optimistic case. Yeah. How about you, Judge? Uh, I, I mean, I agree largely. I think the important thing to remember is, is, is what is a city for? A city is a machine for helping people interact with each other. That's the only reason we exist. Otherwise, it would be very easy for us to send stuff through the mail or, or email or wherever else we need to do packages. The reason we all live in cities is because we do want to interact with each other. There's two types of those interactions. There's one, there's the productive side. We work with other people in the same office space. We learn to drive to different uh, law firms or lobbying firms or what other firms you have. Uh, to make our business operate uh, uh, more efficiently. Now, a lot of that can be done online, perhaps. Uh, but the most, one of the most surprising things in the past 40 years is you've been having people for 40 years tell you, well, now that we have, say, uh, universal postal rates and easy package delivery or FedEx, or now that we have uh, toll-free dialing, we can get people to live anywhere. Time and time again, they say, well, this new technology shows that we can live anywhere we want to. And the opposite has happened. We've been more concentrated in cities uh, because a lot of those in-person interactions uh, turn out to be a lot more fun and engaging than uh, a lot of the interactions we can get purely through technology. And San Francisco is one of obviously the most concentrated industrial places in terms of industrial sector being the software industry and the world, despite the fact that they make the very thing that hopes people to spread out. Uh, so I'm pretty bullish, even though I agree with Reva, there will be some spreading out over that over the long term. People want to interact with it, and there's a lot of reasons to do that. Uh, now, the other part about a city, which I think we can be very bullish about, is that it's a machine to also interact, uh, to play with each other, to have fun together. The amenity side of a city. There's no way I can live in Jackson Hole and have access to 45 different Chinese restaurants within a 10-minute drive. There isn't a way, frankly, if I was single, to have an easy dating market. You can't have a biggest pool of dating partners over in Jackson Hole as you can in San Francisco. Uh, there isn't a way for concerts, opera, all the rest of it. All of those things about cities, we're going to want to still do that with other human beings. And as long as we're going to want to do that, people are going to want to keep living in cities. And uh, uh, so over the long term, we'll keep spreading out a little bit. Even our most dense cities are actually less dense than they were uh, 40, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Manhattan is gradually spreading out over into Westchester County and over even into Middlesex and New Jersey. Uh, people are still driving into the city and do that. That'll keep happening. But the ability to keep interacting with each other, both for work and most importantly for enjoying each other, 
uh, that's going to continue. People are going to want to do that in cities. That's great. And actually, Riva, you mentioned sort of ideological diversity as sort of an issue driving people sort of exodus in different ways. Can you guys in our last sort of section speak to that? Like how much is sort of like diversity of thought and basically a, a, a region that's hospitable to diverse viewpoints going to play into the way people think about these things? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, one of the things I was going to follow up from Josh's point was that, uh, you know, it's also a difference between like big cities and little cities, right? It's a, it's a different people are tragic to different things. And one of the things that I've particularly pro, uh, enjoyed from going from somewhere, which is, you know, I'd say intellectually, industrially wide as San Francisco, to somewhere like uh, to Las Vegas, is that everyone that I meet here is kind of like a card counter or a felon, which is a, you know, a big change to what I, what I came from. Um, and but you don't realize how much your mind becomes uh, kind of adapts to the uh, uh, the the sphere of influence that you have around you in a city. Like I I think way less about uh, technology just by osmosis by by being in Vegas. Um, and I just I think it's I think it'd be great. I think if we can get more diversity and see more people moving around, more mobility. Um, you know, is it a bad thing if all of the technology industry isn't condensed in San Francisco? Probably not. I think it's great that Austin's booming and and other places because you'll have new different factions and new different ideas, and you know the climate will affect things and the local industries and and what agriculture everything will affect what inspires being built there. And we can't just be technology building for technology people's sake in one place, right? So I think the diversity has potential for huge benefits. Uh, yeah, how about you, Judge? Uh, yeah, the last thing on this sort of concentration uh, before I get to the diversity is, yeah, over the long term, we're probably still, the center of the technology industry will be in San Francisco, just like the center of the automotive industry is still in Detroit. Detroit itself is not incredibly booming. A lot of those manufacturing jobs are spread out. The three automakers are still based there, and the big tech companies are still going to be based there, and that's not going to change. So San Francisco's got that going for it. On political diversity, that's a little more difficult. Now you have uh, uh, you have an area back 10 years ago, a guy named Bill Bishop wrote a book called The Big Sort. We're sorting out into different groups, and you used to have a places where geography wasn't as determinate. Dallas was a conservative city that voted Republican. Oklahoma City, uh, Columbus, or Cincinnati, these other places were pretty conservative. Now, if you're in a city, you're Democratic and you're on the left, almost universally. Dallas is in Houston and these other cities we think is these kind of, uh, you know, conservative bastions are voting about as Democratic as people in Philadelphia or New York City. Uh, that's going to be is somewhat of an issue of cities. I think it's dangerous politically because it prevents us from interacting more with people on the other side. The best they just like talked about those sort of benefits of interacting with other people for playing and for work. Uh, the other benefit of that is opening our minds to people with different points of view. As long as geography itself is now being partially determined by political preference, and that seems to keep being continuing, it's going to be a lot more difficult for us to learn to talk to each other across political boundaries. And that is one of my biggest concerns in the city. I hope, like Riva, we can keep, there's ways to get increase that diversity. Over the long term, there has to be. Uh, but uh, in the short term, as long as we're, we're sorting out into suburban and rural Republicans and, and urban Democrats, uh, those partisan divides are going to be a lot harder to bridge. So uh, in our last two minutes, one minute each, um, Riva, why are you excited about Vegas? You're obviously there now. So like, what's here? Why are you excited about Vegas? And then for you, Judge, like, why are you excited about Austin? Where you'll be, where you'll be soon? Uh, I'll make some campaigns for Vegas, although, you know, as much as I love Vegas, the main reasons why I picked to come here was, uh, you know, you can, the, the airport airlines are subsidized by the casinos. You can fly to LA or San Francisco for $60 on a day off. Um, so it's pretty good. Uh, that's a, that's a benefit. Um, so you can basically just live in California, but not be there. Every time I want to go do California things, I do it. And then I come back and save my taxes, which is great. Um, uh, but the other thing is that, you know, I, I spent yesterday in a neon sign boneyard out in North, North Las Vegas and learned about the history of Vegas and, and signs and stuff. And there was an element where this was too much as the coastal elite likes to sniff at it. There was a, this was like a, um, entertainment mecca of the US. And there's this kind of like old glam Hollywood vibe that still burgeons somewhere amongst all the trash. So 
it's something about the surrealism of Vegas, I really like. Do I think lots of people should move here? No. I mean, there aren't lots of people to talk to unless you like to do the cultural tourism that I do and talk to all the felons and, and, and the gamblers. But, uh, but there is something that's interesting about just experiencing different parts of America, right? Like, I don't think I'll go back to California anytime soon. I'd love to live in Texas for some time. I'd love to just, you get a, uh, you, you are inspired in different ways by different places that you live. And I feel like life is too short to just be in one place forever. Like, that's basically how I feel, even on a national level. Uh, and I think that we should explore more and, and, and be a bit more adventurous around about it. Um, for me, I, uh, you couldn't pay me to live in Vegas. I don't know how high the price would have to be, but uh, to each their own. Diversity of cities, you can choose different places where to live. Austin, this has a lot, just like San Francisco, has a lot of opportunity, a lot of smart tech people. But frankly, it's a lot cheaper, and that's a huge advantage. If you can have those amenities with a cheaper price, why not? Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, to sum it up in a word, that's uh, the main advantage of moving down there. All the things we like uh, at half the price, so. Gambling, gambling, gambling. Yeah, yeah, less gambling. Who's that? You go, to FanDuel. you go to FanDuel now. You can do it all online. You can do that. You can drink in your your, your bourbon at home and gamble. <laughs> on that on that uh, positive note, uh, depending on your perspective, uh, that's a great place to end. Judge Riva, thank you so much. This has been really thank great. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Really appreciate it.